Yeah, let's, let's get started by asking Lorna to tell us about yourself. Lorna. And to tell you about myself, I feel awful shy. And to me, I'm just an ordinary person. And I know I'm a Catholic, but it wouldn't matter if we were doing this in the field, or if it was in a synagogue, or some other other church, or, or Jewish, or anything like that. It wouldn't make any difference. That's nice of you. Thank you very much. Um, I see angels physically, um, as I see all of you sitting there in the chairs, in the seats. And I see the guardian angel behind each and every one of you, that beautiful light. But the same or different? Are our guardian angels the same or different? Do they look different? Yes, each guardian angel looks different. But yet, how, how, how can I explain that? Yet I know the guardian angels because your guardian angel never leaves you for one second, so you're never, never alone. And you have to remember your guardian angel is a gift from God, the gatekeeper of your soul. And that speck of light, what, what is your soul of God? And that so is Could you God. describe what, let's say, my guardian angel or Reverend Jim Forbes guardian angel look like? And how do they differ? How are they same? Just curious, you know? Well, I always explain that there's something like generals, but they're neither male nor female. And I'm just asking, would one guardian angel, at least one, not too many, um, would that light just open up so I could, could describe? And I am asking uh, for... Jim Forbes. Reverend Ford. Reverend Ford. Um, so I'm asking that, and I, I do have to smile because your guardian angel, the light hasn't opened up, but when you came in first, and I, I saw you, and um, your guardian angel, that light opened up um, completely. And the only way I can describe the guardian angel is that it is giving a male appearance um, at, the, at that time, but it is neither male nor female, and was, what would I say, as tall as the pillars there, just to give you an example, and looking down and over you, and very, very strong, and how can I describe the clothing was like of a purple and a gold and as if it was part of it kind of like armor. It's the only way I, I can, can describe but you have to remember your, your guardian angel um, sometimes can appear as female and sometimes when, when it happens I can't say whether it's male or female. And you say you know, most of us see all children see angels but at a certain age, when they're around two or three or four years old, they begin to lose that capability. Is it, lose, most, is it naturally, or is it because they're taught, or what? Or what? Um, I, I suppose because of the world today, um, children lose it. And I do notice that a lot of children are even losing it earlier. Um, because, you know, when a child turns around and says something, a parent passes comment. Or, or they're told, you know, because, you know, the chair has to be solid, your toys have to be solid. If it is something that isn't, it's not real. So a lot of children do close down, but yet today, a lot of children are more open. And I do believe by watching, you should look at all of you, and, you know, you're all here, you've all listened to your guardian angel, you've all come, and it doesn't matter what faith you are, um, you, you have listened and, and you have come and to me that is a wonderful, a wonderful thing. When a child passes comment to its parent, to the mother or father or even to an aunt or uncle, um, you shouldn't just dismiss it, but you should take heed of what the child has said. But don't question the child. Can, can adults... So, can adults begin to see? Can we regain this ability to see angels as we are old? Um, I hope so, because I have to smile, because at times when I would bless people after a talk, you know, individually, um, the elderly, sometimes an elderly woman or an elderly man would say to me, um, Lorna, I saw an angel, but they don't tell, you know, the family member in case they think they're senile and put them into a nursing home, so they keep it a secret, you know. Um, I, I do believe at certain times people see angels physically as I do, but it's probably only for a brief moment. What, what should we, what is important for us to know about angels and our relationship with them? 
and how can we improve our relationships with the angels and what do they do for us? Well, I think for everyone is to first remember that every person has a guardian angel, regardless of what their faith is, what religion they are, or even if people say to me, what about bad people? I'm afraid they have a guardian angel as well. You've got to remember that. You know, every single person has. I'm traveling the world now, and I haven't seen anybody without a guardian angel. Here in New York, walking up and down the streets, you know, I've been watching out because people are saying, have you seen anyone yet without a guardian angel? I know if I saw someone and they hadn't a guardian angel, I don't know what I would do. I would be horrified because something would be very, very wrong. Has that happened? No, thanks to God. And I always pray that it never, never happens. And we, we just have to remember everyone has and try and listen. And remember, God has given you your guardian angel as a gift. And God's angels, regardless of what religion you are, you know, will never ask you to do anything wrong. If you do something wrong, if you're being angry or mean or stealing or, you know, do, doing anything at all, um, you're actually listening to the other side. What is this other side? You talk about it. And I know. It is, is it personified? Because we believe as Muslims in angels. We also believe in jinns. These are what they call, I mean, I believe is what, in reading your book, you have a story about you and your dad going to a particular hut somewhere on a fishing expedition, on a fishing trip or something like that, and he discovers a poltergeist. And, and this, this spirit or this being that you call a poltergeist really is what we call jinns in, in our faith tradition. And we believe that, that there, there are both good jinns and there are bad jinns, and, and we even have people who are possessed by a jinn. So uh, how does this relate to the, the guardian angel? And let's say, do you, believe in, do you believe in a similar thing first? And if so, do you believe that what happens to the guardian angel at that point in time? Can you say that again? Okay. Uh, Just the last bit, I didn't... Uh, yeah, do, do, do you, if you believe that there are people who are possessed by what you call poltergeists, what is the role of the guardian angel at that point in time? Is the guardian angel around? Has he or she, uh, you know, Yes. Gone to the other side or no, something has happened? No, you have to remember, and once you're living, you're alive. And even if, if that happens, you know, what I call the post poltergeist possesses you, and your guardian angel is there, it never, never leaves you. It won't give up. You have to remember, your guardian angel is a gift from God, it's the gatekeeper of your soul. It will not give up, it will help you to fight the other side. I call it the other side because one day God did introduce me. I'm a Catholic, so I would call him Satan, the head of all of all of the evil and the bad. Um, we believe in that too. And I was literally terrified. And a lot of people try to deny that the other side exists, but I'm afraid it does. You only have to look out into the world today and you see it. So the guardian angel, um, doesn't give up and that story was the time I went fishing with my dad and the angels had said to me, you know, Lord, there's something I'm going to show you and try and not be afraid. But of course I was terrified because of what happened in this falling down house. Um, and I have come across the poltergeist um, on other occasions but I haven't written about it. You know, and it is very important to, to remember um, sometimes people might call them evil spirits. You know, they might call them by different names in different religions. Um, but they are belong to the other side. They're not actually a soul. They're not the soul of a person. So do you want to ask another question on it? Oh, so but, I, but, but, because it's a huge subject. For us as spiritual people and religious people who believe in angels, who believe in the interaction with angels, communications with angels. When in our Quran, for example, uh, which for us is God speaking to us, God tells us that those who believe in God and who are upright, uh, the angels will descend upon them and tell them, we are your protectors in this life and in the next, and we are your guardian, and uh, you have nothing to fear. Uh, but at the same time, we also believe in, in, in Satan, we also believe in the, uh, what you call the other side, or 
the, the negative side, the enemy side. And for us to navigate our lives uh, successfully, we need to know, we need to learn of uh, what you might call the spiritual landmines that, uh, that on our journey can trip us. And as much as it's important for us to learn about angels and how we can be inspired by them, I think it's also important for us uh, in our spiritual journey to understand also what they call them poltergeist, call them jinns, learn about the, the, the negative side and how they can cause major problems for us as agents of Satan, don't you think? Yes, and they do cause huge problems for us. That's why I often at times when I'm in prayer and um, I do even give out to God, you know, and I know that might be a shock to you, but I, w I would say, God, why hasn't all these wars stopped? Why has man moved on spiritually? Because I know if, if we would move on spiritually, if all faiths would join together under the one umbrella, as I have been shown, will happen someday, but I'd wish it would actually move faster. And there would be no wars. So at times I do get cross, if that's the right word to use, um, when I hear of wars and, you know, people going hungry and, you know, no education or people having no roof over their head. We all have to play our part. It's very, very important. And we all actually need to listen to our angels more, to the angels that God has given us right across the board in all religions, regardless of whether you call them angels or you might call them something else because we have to move forward spiritually and it is part of a spiritual evolution that is going on at the moment. Like, I can't read or write. You know, and people who say, how did you write the books you have written? But you have to remember, you know, God chose this time, I didn't, to, to help that spiritual evolution to, to happen, to help. Why do you think he has me coming back to the States all the time? He keeps sending me here. He says, you mustn't give up on the American people, on all of the different religions there. They have to gather together. Um, because America has such a huge role to play, you know, um, for world peace all around the world, for what, what we call interfaith, you know, all, all of that gathering. And we have to learn not to be listening to the other side. You mentioned also in your book that, uh, you mentioned in your book that the angels told you not to tell anyone about them uh, until a few years ago after you died. And uh, what now? Does that have to do with the state of the world or does it have to do with the, with the state of your life? I don't believe it has anything to do with my life <laughs> at all. I believe it has to do with the state of the world. It, it is. It is, you know, God's choice. It is what he has decided is to happen. Oh, what way can I put it? I have no control over my life an awful lot of the time. You know, when the angel said to keep it a secret, I was only a child, and I did keep it a secret. But as I grew as a child, you know, I could see all of the time why they said I had to keep it a secret. The doctors had, um, said I was retarded because I couldn't read, you know, because I got mixed up with different things. But way back in Ireland, I'm dyslexic. I'm probably not even pronouncing that properly. But way back in Ireland, then, if you said, um, you know, Mom, there's a beautiful angel standing right there beside you, you know, I wouldn't be here. I would have been put into an institution. So God protected me with his angels. And that's what you have to remember. God protects us all, but we must listen. And we have this terrible habit of not listening. What frightens me and worries me a lot is that we listen to the other side. We listen to, you know, the poltergeist. We let it get in. We listen to Satan, whatever we want to call it. Um, and we allow the material things to rule our lives, even though I know we all need material things. I even need material things. But one must remember, you can't bring any material thing to heaven with you when you die. How, how do you, you tell when you are... How, how can we tell that we are listening to the poltergeist side, the satanic side, or the angelic side? Well, to me that's actually quite simple. <laughs> 
um, and maybe it's not so simple to everybody else. It really is when you're being dishonest or greedy or it's just like, you know, sometimes I, I would meet men maybe in their 40s or 50s or even older and they would say, Lona, I just read your book and you know, I am realizing how much I have been listening to the other side. You know, it's like as if it's awakening for them. You know, and they say they don't want to be, how would you, how would you say it, without hurting anyone. They don't want to be that criminal. They don't want to be that selfish person. They don't want to trample down someone else like they have all their lives. You know, in that in that way, or or like the some sometimes I have met people that have been in countries where there's war even now, and you know their family was murdered or shot, or, you know bombs dropping and all that kind of thing, and they felt so angry, and they would say to me, Lorna, how can you kill revenge? Because I went to done the same thing because my family were killed, and we have to. We have to stop, we have to destroy revenge, you know, not to strike back. And I know that is very, very hard, but yet in Northern Ireland, in my own country, um, where there has been war for such a long, long time, and now there is peace, but there is still a few who want to make war again in, in that way, but yet the people, of that part of the country, every time they plant a bomb or they do something or they kill an innocent person, the people stand up and say, we don't want this. They, they really condemn um, and they don't tally it back, if I'm using the right word. They're actually listening to, they're listening to God. And nearly all of those people up there are Protestants, not Catholics. You know, it's kind of more Protestant than Catholic. Um, and they have you become they they're trying to become together under the same roof, and we have to do that all over the world. And I love America because there are so many different faiths here. Yeah, from reading your book, reading your book, where you talked about as a little girl, you were um, walking with your mother, and you was, you saw crowds of angels outside a Protestant church and a Catholic church, and from your point of view, which point of the of the angelic realm, uh, you know, truth was truth, and the church was a church, and the notion that there should be ideologies in religion struck you as being very, very uh, anti-spiritual, if I can use that word. Uh, and um, and your comment about America, I think, is very well taken. Uh, I certainly feel that from my own travels, there is a certain need for us today to. Um, to, uh, to, to develop, a, to, to see our religions, not from a parochial point of view and differentiate ourselves from others uh, as being, we are the only ones who have the, both the truth and you don't have the truth kind of an attitude, but how to develop a, a sense of who we are as, uh, as you know, believers, regardless of whether we are Protestant, Catholic, whether we're Muslim, Christian, Sunni, Shia, etc. I think that to me was something which struck me very powerfully about when I was reading your book. Would you care to comment to us about that and, and, and about how you feel perhaps that America um, is the way to, to, to this particular kind of an understanding where we can, where we can um, emphasize the common ground of our religious traditions without losing sight of our differences and yet celebrating them? Well, I, how, how can I put it, even here now, this very moment, and I, I don't know what all the different religions are here, whether most people are Muslim or Jew or, or Christian. We can have a show of hands if you wish. Okay, let's see. Well, I have to smile at that because I just see, you know, the, the light of the guardian angel behind each and every one of you, and this building, is full of angels as well. Um, I'm just watching the angels, you know, at times walking in the door there. I don't know how they can all fit in here. Everywhere I go, no matter whether it's a hall or it's a church or it's a, you know, a field, um, the angels seem to just keep on pouring in and they're here joining us, joining with us. Because this is what God wants. Do you see them at a church or a house of worship? 
uh, all the time, or did, did they cry more when people are going in to pray? They cry more when people are coming in to pray. Um, and that is one wonderful thing when people are in prayer, or even if it's not, like I was in um, this church actually today, another part of it, and there was one lady in there, and I think she was there praying for quite a while. And I was just watching her, and the angels of prayer, they're like a, ne a never ending stream, waterfalls. I'm always trying to find ways to, to describe it. It's hundreds of thousands of angels of prayer going up instead of coming down when you're praying. And that's one thing we all have to remember we don't pray enough. And I'd love to see all religions, you know, gather together, all faiths, and pray together. Like, that is very, very important. And to respect each other the way we pray, you know, and not to feel afraid or of the differences that each of us have. Because if each and every person here started to pray in the way you would pray within your custom of your religion, um, the angels of prayer are doing the same thing with each and every one of you. They're enhancing your prayer. Prayer is prayer. And that's what we have to remember. It doesn't matter, you know, who's saying the prayer. Even if it is just one word, prayer is so, so powerful. It moves mountains. You know, um, and I know your book kind of says the same thing in, in one sense on the name of it on the cover. But we don't pray enough at all. And the angels, I have to smile now, but you have to remember, I see the angels physically as I'm seeing you all sitting here. And the angels at the moment have all stopped dead still because we're talking about prayer. And that is something we must remember. There is nothing evil or anything like that in here. Maybe they stopped about to listen? Yes, they stopped because prayer is so important. It's like even when a thought of prayer comes for many of us, God's angels give such, how would I say it? It's like a tension. It's like an alarm that goes off. I try to find human ways to, to express it. Um, and I would love, like I went to the mosque to pray, you know, and I loved praying there. You know, what's it called, 51? I've had the right name. And I was there and there was a few women in, in one corner and I was there with them. And it was just so unbelievable watching all the people coming in, mainly men, and they all going to pray and just watching the angels of prayer. And as well as that, all the other angels coming in with everybody. Because no matter where you pray, it becomes a spiritual place or a holy place, even if it is a corner in your room. And that's a place where you sit, where you're silent in whatever way you pray. And that's very, very important. I'm saying to people all over the world, because life is moving so fast and people are saying, oh, I don't have time to pray. But you have to have time to pray. It is very, very important. Even if you're at the kitchen sink, you know, washing dishes, or you're sitting in your car, if you can say a prayer, it is very important. We need this world to change. And I'm telling the angels, why aren't you moving? You know, I'm doing something. And they're, they're, because prayer, it's a very important subject to talk about the joining together of all things in prayer. That's very interesting. In fact, prayer, you know, you remind as a Muslim, we are taught that uh, after faith in God, prayer is the most important action. And on the Day of Judgment, that's the first thing that we will be tested on or examined our, our prayers. And I know there are many Muslims, particularly one who wants today, who don't, you know, not sure about angels and this kind of stuff, but the Quran is replete with, uh, with many, many instances of, of angels who, uh, who communicate with us, who guard us, who protect us, who even com communicate with us and speak with us and, and inspire us with things, as well as those who protect us with things. And also angels, as you said, who, uh, who bear witness to our acts of worship and prayer and to go up to God and say, you know, we witnessed, you know, uh, 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 Lorna was in the prayers and, and she was busy doing that. And 
and uh, many, many stories like this. We even have a, a hadith of the Prophet who says that, you know, uh, uh, there are angels watching you coming in uh, to, the, uh, to, to the mosque on Friday. And when the, when the Imam goes up to begin to give his sermon, they all walk in and listen, sit down and listen. So there are many hadith like this that speak about, uh, about angels. And, and this is why I find, uh, yeah, I found your book very, uh, uh, very helpful and very inspiring to see. Because for me as a Muslim, to, to see you speak about the reality of angels as a witness, as a witness not only in the Christian sense, in the religious sense of being a witness to something which is of the nature of the divine, uh, to me is, a, is, is very powerful, very instructive, because we learn from each other. We learn from each other's faith traditions. And uh, it's wonderful that, uh, that you're here with us to, uh, to expand this, this idea that we need to, to, uh, to, to build this platform of prayer and blessing, both for ourselves, for each other, and, and for our community and for the world. So um, this is a very hopeful message. Yes, it is a very hopeful message, and I, I just pray and hope, and the angels are saying yes to say this, that all communities of all different faiths to open your doors, to allow the stranger to walk in regardless of what religion they are. That is very, very important. And to remember, you know, say the Muslims or the Jews or, or the Christians or the Catholics or the Protestants, you know, start to open the doors and to allow others to come in of different faiths as well. And if they hear of another community, of another faith, having difficulty to reach out and go and help. Don't say, oh, they're not my religion, they're not my faith, so I don't help them. We have to open those doors and allow the children in. And not to be feeling that, well, I always remember one lady saying to me, well, we, we have opened our doors and we're hoping to put our numbers up. You know, not to feel that you have to grab someone and change their faith. God does that. God finds us all, each and every one of us. And this is something we must remember. I, I do get into trouble all around the world, you know, because when I started to write, I said to God, what am I to do? Am I to call you Jesus? Am I to call you Father? Am I to call you the Holy Spirit? I was going through a whole load of things. And he just looked at me and said, Lorna, what do you call me? And I was literally shocked. And he said that because I said, God, of course. And he said, well, then you call me God and call me God universal. And that's why I say that. But yet, in my own country, in Ireland, I get into trouble for not saying Jesus constantly you know, for using the word God. But God is our Father. And it doesn't matter what name and what religion we call him, it's still God. And that there is only one God, I know that. Yeah, the story in our tradition of, uh, of two who are having an argument because they should call God Allah or the merciful Ar-Rahman. And this became an argument, they went to the Prophet and there was a Quranic verse which came down which says, Qurad Allah wa Ar-Rahman whether you call upon Allah, whether you call upon the merciful, to him belongs all the beautiful names. And therefore, by whatever name you, 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 you call upon God, and suddenly God is that which is at the end of the day, ultimately the unnamed, and in the absolute sense, the unknowable too. My dear beloved friend, the Reverend Dr. James Forbes, to, uh, to, to say a few words, and perhaps to also inspire us in a way that no other person I know can do. Reverend Jim. <laughs> now, my job is to respond to, to what was being said in my spirit as I listened to the exchange. Um, the first is a mystic. My understanding is that when you are with mystics, 
Your theology is only of secondary significance. <laughs> because in the case of mystics, it is the relationship to the ultimate, to God, to, to spirit that matters most. I think listening to you makes me believe that we should all acknowledge the importance and irrelevance of particularity. <laughs> so I have my particular faith, I have my particular approach to faith, and, and I have the scriptures I believe, and I have the practices I'm called to, and that's, that's, that, that, that's so important and irrelevant if the relationship is there. Can you speak to us about what the angel of America might be yearning for us as a nation to hear at this time? I have to smile because I have written a little about um, every country, every nation has the angel of that nation and America has an angel of this nation and the angel of the nation up here in America is working very hard to gather you all together, to pull you all together, to be one and for you to remember that you are one nation. You are one people, regardless of your religion, your beliefs. So what I have been told is that the angel of the nation of America wants you to put your difference aside and come together as one because you have a huge part in the future of the world to play. So I just wish you to hurry up a bit, you know. <laughs> I really would. So open, open the doors. Invite others in, but don't try and steal them. Don't try and prove to them that your God is better than theirs. You're to open the door and welcome them in and allow them to pray. You know, all religions should be able to walk in here and pray, or come here, or into and or a president um, and share their problems and ask you for help and it should be vice versa and you should you know be all able to pray together and not to fear each other there's no reason to fear each other i better say no more <laughs> thank you i would like to close with my word i'm using language spirit but it, I think I need an angel too. So this is my closing prayer and my comments. It is called, The Spirit is the Key to Community. The Spirit is the key to community, where love and justice flow like streams, where the people work together for the common good, to make our cities safe for dreams. The Spirit sets us free from anxiety about our neighbors far and near. When we learn to welcome strangers, greeting them as friends, no longer are we bound by fear. The Spirit sees the world as a neighborhood the Spirit yearns for wars to cease. So the Spirit forms a circle of freedom-loving friends to claim the world for joy and peace. And then the chorus says something like, Spirit of community, draw us close to thee. Help us see the beauty within diversity. Begin with me, my family, each neighborhood and nation. Fulfill the dream you had in mind, the first day of creation.
Thank you so much.